Okay, everyone. So, last session of the day, respiratory medicine. It's almost like the graveyard shift of lectures, and it's tragic the coffee ran out. I'm very upset. Um, I'm sure you need no reminder of the date. We're going to use a different um, presentation software today. Um, those of you with motion sickness, I'd just like to remind you that the nearest thing we have to Horizon would be the back of the lecture theatre. I hope none of you feel, feel queasy or anything like that. Um, and we're going to talk about respiratory medicine. Respiratory medicine is a brilliant topic. It covers a wide range of conditions and they'll go through all kinds of things that you learnt during your first couple of years, basic science. So we'll go through immunology, there's uh, microbiology when you're talking about pneumonias, anatomy and physiology. So we'll visit all of those, those areas. So There's a really interesting specialty. My name's Stephen Wing and I, I work on um, PodMedics with, with Ed. Um, and this is the kind of structure of the lecture that I want to try and follow. We're going to spend about 15, 20 minutes, minutes per subject and give you a couple minutes break, mainly for me, so I can have a drink and, uh, and a chill out. And we're going to go through the main topics. Respiratory medicine is very, very big. And I'm going to concentrate on the things that you will see day in, day out. In our hospital, I work in Essex, and a recent audit we did there showed around 60 to 65% of all acute general medical admissions were respiratory. So I'm going to focus on the big topics, nothing complicated, the simple things. We'll do a bit of data interpretation. Um, we're going to do spirometry. We're going to do arterial blood gases and chest x-rays. These are fundamental to understanding respiratory medicine. Then we're going to talk about asthma, COPD. We're going to go through pneumonia, a bit of tuberculosis at the end, not very much. Um, then we're going to go through lung cancer and pulmonary embolism. It's going to be a quick fly-through, really. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the kind of systems that, that, that I was talking about. Um, I'm going to do it in a slightly different way, but we end up meeting in very much the same place. The thing to say is, though, whatever system you do choose to study clinical medicine or work on the wards, it's important that it's yours and you're able to use it. You know, may have developed it yourself, but be consistent. Whatever you choose, try. It's not to say that you can't adapt it. You can adapt it to whatever your clinical needs, whether you're working in surgery or medicine. But, but try and stick with something that you're happy with, you're familiar with, and you're going to use. Um, and wherever possible, I want to use this kind of format. Um, history, examination, investigations, and management. And we'll see that a bit later when we go through some, with some of the conditions. Okay, data interpretation. So we'll go through a few things. Arterial blood gases, chest x-rays, and spirometry. And I'll go through chest x-rays first. <laughs> Okay, you feel sick? Who hey, feels sick? You will do. After uh, uh, you know, uh, 105 minutes, you'll start to feel queasy. Okay, we're going to go through how to read them. And there's so much to know. I mean, radiology is its own specialty in itself, so I'm not going to attempt to go through absolutely everything. Okay? But what I am going to do is just give you a very simple system to start off. I'm going to tell you how to technically assess a chest X-ray, see whether it's a good one or a bad one, to, to, you know, to ask you whether you need to send that patient for another chest x-ray. The radiographer is usually quite good, and they, they make that assessment themselves. And just a very quick mnemonic, the ABC mnemonic, airways, breathing, and circulation. We'll go through that, and we'll go through a few of the, the common presentations you might see. I've got some x-ray examples. Okay, so here's a chest x-ray, a largely normal chest x-ray. And if you remember, the chest x-ray film starts off white, and you fire x-rays with the patient in between that screen. And the areas that are exposed to x-rays turn black, and the areas that don't get exposed to so much x-rays stay white. So the denser the, the, the thing obstructing the x-rays, the more white it's going to be. OK, so here we, you know, the bones are looking more white than the lung parenchyma, and the heart's looking more white than the lung parenchyma as well. And outside, all the black, that's air, where x-rays have gone through uninterrupted. And there are two different types of chest x-ray. There's uh, PA, or posterior to anterior chest x-ray, where the x-rays go through the posterior to the anterior of the patient. And so it would be kind of like this, if I'm standing there. The x-rays would go from behind me onto the x-ray film. And there's an AP x-ray. And AP x-rays are where the x-rays go from the anterior to the posterior on the x-ray film. And the significance of that is, is that things look different on the two. X-rays are, if you imagine them, to, they travel in straight lines like light and they cast shadows. And if the heart on an AP X-ray is here at the front of me, it's going to cast a, quite a large shadow. 
more larger than when I'm standing here and the heart's very close to the film. So be aware of that. Um, the way to tell the difference is to, to look at two things, really, that I use. I look at the ribs. And these are posterior ribs. These look more horizontal. Okay? And uh, these are the anterior ribs here. I don't know if you can see the laser pointer. It's not very good. So these that curve round, these are the anterior ribs. And those look different on a chest X-ray, uh, on those two different chest X-rays. And also, the other thing is, with a posterior X-ray, the scapula are moved away from the lung field. So they're generally better. A PA chest X-ray is generally better, but in you know, emergency situations or where the patient's not very mobile, we'll, we'll do an AP X-ray. And the heart looks bigger on that. So how to technically assess? There are lots of things you need to look at. First is the penetration. And that's how many X-rays were fired. If it's under-penetrated, the film will look too white. There's not enough X-rays to go through that to make it look black. And the way you assess it is you look at the X-ray, and you see if you can see the thoracic vertebra through here, through the board of the heart. I don't know if you can see that, although I mean, I, I can see them quite clearly. Can you, can you all see that? Yeah? So you can see the thoracic vertebrae through the heart border, and that suggests that this is a good, good penetrated film. The next one is inspiration. When you take a chest X-ray, you want to see as much of the lung field as possible, and things could look vastly different between a poor and good inspiration. So you want to see the patient take a nice, big, deep breath in. And the way you do that is you count the number of ribs you can see. The bigger the inspiration, the more ribs. Okay? So... Let's use posterior, and the figure you're looking at is it, nine is a very excellent inspiration. Eight um, is what, what you'll get most of the time. So if we just count these over here, so there's one, there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, and can't really see an eight. So not bad. That's quite a good inspiration there. Okay. Next one is rotation. Chest X is going to look very different. In the media style is going to be very distorted and project over the lung fields if the patient's side onto the x-rays or are slightly rotated. And the way to look at that is look at the uh, spinous process. So that's these parts in the middle. I can't see that there because the light's shining. I don't know if you can see it. These parts in the middle here are the spinous processes of the vertebrae. And these two things here are the heads of the clavicle. And you want to check that these are in the middle of the clavicles. And that's quite central on. That is, it's unusual to get that, to be honest with you, um, on most chest x-rays you see. Uh, then we want to check for angulation, and that says whether the x-rays are shot up at the patient or shot down. And the way to do that is look at the clavicles and see whether they appear above or below the apices. You want the apices above the clavicles like this. This is very nice. If they're shot up from the patient, you see the clavicles above the apices. That's called apical lordotic, and you should really be interpreting chest x-rays with caution when you do that. Um, next is I want to move on to how you start to interpret a chest X-ray. There's lots of things to look at. The best way is to be systematic, to have a system. Just as the systems that Ed, Ed were talking about, they make sure you don't forget anything, they focus your mind, um, rather than just looking at a chest X-ray. Um, with time, you won't necessarily need to do that system. You'll be able to tell instantly, this looks like this, and you won't really, be, you won't really know why you know that. You'll just know that this is the diagnosis. And if someone asks you to explain it, you could use a system. But when you're learning, it's good to have a system to use until you're familiar with the kind of presentations you see on X-ray. I had a story once, I'm not sure where it's from. That, um, it takes a consultant radiologist 0.04 seconds to recognize an abnormal chest X-ray. That's pretty fast. But not to say that they know exactly what the diagnosis is, they just know that's wrong. And they'll be able to tell very quickly after that. But that's very, very quick. I'm not sure how they measured that. Um, so first of all, I like to do... A, B, C. First of all, look at the airway. So if we're looking at this one, we'll look at the trachea. And the trachea is this structure in the middle. It appears nicely here on this chest X-ray, either side of the spinous process, and then splits into two, which is the carinum. Okay? And this happens at the level of T4. So where you see the carinum, it's not very well shown on this X-ray. That's T4 vertebra. Okay? And this is the, the right main bronchus, and this is the left main bronchus, but we can't really see it because they're aortic knuckles in the way. And when you look at the airways, you want to see that there's no tracheal deviation, as such in a, a, you know, a pneumothorax, whether it's a, a tension pneumothorax, where the tracheal will get deviated away from the tension. Okay? So look, check that's in the middle. And this one, it is. Okay? Then we'll move on to B. And B stands for breathing. And um, I also tag on the end of it, bones. So breathing, we'll look at the lung field. Take one first, then the other. Look all the way around. Look at the pleura. See there's no pleural plaques or anything like that. Um, and then take the other one, look all the way down, look at here. Down here is the costophrenic angle, and up here is the cardiophrenic angle, and you've got a right and a left one. 
and look at those and then look at all of the lung field and see if you can see anything wrong in the lung field. This is normal chest x-ray and uh, I can't see anything wrong here, I'm sure um, there'll be some radiologists that might spot something abnormal. Um, then move on to the bones and you can go around and look at the ribs and you're looking for destruction. You might get that in something like lung cancer where you've got bony destruction. You might see rib fractures, lots of rib fractures. You might see a flail segment. So have a look very closely at all the bones. And it's often forgotten, actually. You see someone come in after a fall, they look at the chest x-ray, there's no pneumonia, but they miss the rib fractures. So be very systematic and, and, and check that out. Um, then we'll look at C, circulation. And I tag on the end to that, soft tissues. Okay? So here we want to look at the mediastinum, which is here. And we want to see if there's any widening of the mediastinum that you might get in aortic arch aneurysm, which there's not. And then we want to look at the, the heart border and the hilum. The hilum look normal here. They can be enlarged in various conditions. You may get lymphadenopathy, perhaps sarcoid. And as we saw in uh, Ed's X-ray of pulmonary edema, you get perihilar opacities. We'll, we'll see those a bit later. So have a look at the hilum and have a look at the heart. Does it look big? And there's something you can do. It's called the cardiothoracic ratio. You can only really do it on a PA film. And it says that the heart size should not be more than 50% of the uh, chest. So you look at the widest part of the chest here and just make sure that this heart size isn't larger than 50% of that. And as we said before, with an uh, AP X-ray, the heart's going to look a bit bigger. So you can't do that. But you can say subjectively that you think the heart looks big. Let's go on to some specific conditions. Okay, I'm going to talk about pneumonia. I've got three pneumonias to show you. Pulmonary edema, COPD, and pneumothorax. It's not everything, but it's just a good... We'll start using this system. I'm not going to go through the system for everyone, maybe the first one, but you know these are things that you should do when you're looking at x-rays on the computer at home, or perhaps one day when you're on the ward and you've got afternoon free, ask one of the junior doctors to log you into the x-ray system and look at all the chest x-rays that were taken in A&E that day and just go through them. Look at your systems, uh, try and assess whether they're technically adequate and go through the ABC, try and recognise different, different patterns. But especially when you've got patients on the ward and someone says, this is heart failure, have a look at the x-ray. See what heart failure looks like, okay? So let's go to pneumonia. And this is one of the rare chances you'll get to see x-rays on a Mac. You might do if you go to work in America, but certainly not here in the UK. We'll get really poor quality screen. Um, so here's, a, here's an x-ray here. Airway. Well, let, let's, uh, let's look at the technically adequ adequacy. So we can see the thoracic vertebra there. Looks a good inspiration. Um, we can see the clavicles are below the apices, so it's not, uh, um, it's not angulated and it's not rotated. It is rotated very slightly, um, but not too bad. Um, airway looks to be in the middle. We look at the lung fields and the obvious abnormality is in the right side, okay, in the right lower zone. Um, radiologists, respiratory physicians, junior doctors spend a lot of time arguing about whether it's middle lobe or lower lobe. But to be safe, I would say it's in the lower zone. It's not upper, is it, clearly here. But as you remember, the right's got three lobes. It could be middle, could be lower. Um, and middle, um, usually recognised by where the right heart border gets obscured. So I think this is probably a lower lobe pneumonia, but it's just safe to say it's in the l um, right lower zone. Okay? And we've got this hazy a pacification consistent with pneumonia. If you look very carefully as well, you can see here we've got uh, a, a lucent line. Can you see that? Can you see it? Yes? No? And that's uh, a, a bronchus, so it's an air bronchogram, where the consolidation around it um, is contrasting with the air inside the bronchus. So that's another sign of consolidation. So this is consolidation. You've got hazy a pacification and an air bronchogram. Have a look at another one. So here's another right lower zone pneumonia. And in this one, we won't go through the system. It's a technically adequate x-ray. I've checked it earlier. Um, and in this one, you can see right lower. You've also got obliteration of the right heart border. So perhaps there's middle, middle lobe involvement as well. And you've got this really nice air bronchogram here. And this nice circle here. What, what do you think that might be? Anyone? Alveolus. So that's an alveoliogram, where the consolidation is showing up. Our, it's probably a bulla, really, but it's showing up nicely. Um, our, um, the, it's contrasting with the, the consolidation around it. So that's a right lower zone pneumonia. Okay. And this one, again a pneumonia on the right, 
but this time it's his upper zone. It's a right upper lobe pneumonia. Can everyone see? So technically adequate X-ray, maybe slightly rotated. Um, maybe it's probably too penetrated, um, but we've got this right upper zone pneumonia. Is everyone happy with that? Okay. Pomodema. My X-ray is not nearly as good as Ed's. And actually last week I had a really fantastic one um, that I was going to show you, but the patient wouldn't let me bring the scan. I could, uh, could have done it anyway, but uh, I decided not to. But this is an AP X-ray. Um, you notice that the ribs look slightly different on this one. And these have got some of the features of pulmonary edema. So if you remember, Ed went through it with us. Cardiomegaly is one of them, okay? AP film can't really do the cardiothoracic ratio properly, but we can look at it and say heart looks subjectively big. I think it looks massive. It looks big, doesn't it? Um, and also we've got these diffuse, starting off perihylar infiltrates. And that's probably fluid, okay? Fluid caused by back pressure from the heart not working properly. So left-sided heart failure causes pulmonary edema. Um, what were some of the other signs? Curly B lines, fluid in the interlobular space, rubbish. I've never seen them. I, I can't really identify them, to be honest with you. Sometimes you see them. They're supposed to be in the lower zones. They're supposed to be horizontal. The bronchial markings and the airway markings go from the hyla out to the periphery. And they, they're, they're diagonal. And curly B lines are supposed to be horizontal and flat, but I can never see them. Um, and I don't think they're a very reliable sign anyway. Um, we've got a bit of fluid here in the horizontal fissure. And that's sort of maybe you know, associated with a pleural effusion as well. Sometimes you can get fluid in that space. But it's just the lungs are very wet and boggy and fluids accumulating in all sorts of spaces. And you can argue that on the left-hand side here that there's probably, um, or there could be, a pleural effusion, a left pleural effusion. Actually, there isn't because I played with the contrast on the um, X-ray machine and you, you can see all the way down to the costophrenic angle. But there could be. There could, you may well associate it with heart failure. You often get um, a small pleural effusion. The other sign was upper lobe diversion. And... The other thing to say with upper lobe diversion is you can only check upper lobe diversion when someone's erect. Because if they're lying flat, of course, all of the blood's going to pull in those veins. And so you can only check. This is fortunately an AP erect film. And we, we've got some upper lobe diversion there. It's very, very hazy up there. So I think there's some upper lobe blood diversion there. Okay? COPD, classic COPD x ray um, on a lady, obviously, by the mammary fields. Technically adequate x ray, maybe slightly rotated. And here, what do you notice about it? It's very hyper-expanded, isn't it? And that's characteristic of chronic asthma or more commonly COPD. Also, she's very thin, and cachexia is a feature of COPD, as we'll go through later. Um, and you've got very flat diaphragms, which is, again, another feature of COPD. So hyperinflation, flat diaphragms. We've got a lot of space between each ribs. All of this lung in between each rib. So very hyper-expanded. Pneumothorax. Which side is it? Left, massive pneumothorax. That's a really big one. Um, but that's the striking abnormality. If we were to do it systematically and start with the airway, what do you notice about the airway? It's deviated, isn't it? So it's a tension pneumothorax, probably traumatic. I don't know where, you know, this, this was an x ray I found on the internet um, uh, on, on one of the gold miner sites. So this is a tension pneumothorax, so a massive pneumothorax here. This one, again, a bit harder to see, but it's on the left. Yeah, left-sided pneumothorax, and again, that's classed as a massive pneumothorax. But this time, no, no deviation, I think. Um, it, the classification between a small and a, a large pneumothorax is two centimetres. So if you look at the top, if it's less than two centimetres, that's a small pneumothorax. If it's more than two centimetres, it's classed as a large pneumothorax. This one's fun. Bit of an odd shaped device there. Again, it's on the left. This is a pacemaker. And sometimes when they insert pacemakers, they go through the cephalic vein. Sometimes they go through the subclavian vein. When they go through the subclavian vein, it's very close to the lung fields. And probably what's happened here is that the, whilst they're going for that subclavian vein, they've punctured the lung. And this has caused a large pneumothorax here. Here you can see the pacing wire going up through this, uh, the subclavian and down into the heart, and probably the puncture there has caused a pneumothorax. Have a look at this one. This is an x-ray from one of my favourite patients I met last year. What's the striking abnormality in this? 
Anyone could be brave? Yeah, dextrocardia, the heart's on the wrong side. I don't know if you notice at the beginning of Scrubs, but the x-ray he puts up at the beginning of Scrubs is the wrong way around. And I think it's just the x-ray flipped. But this is actually true, dextrocardia. Um, what else can we see? Okay, airway looks okay. Um, the lung fields, they don't look right, do they? There's something wrong there, something not quite right. And if you look at it, you can see lots of end-on bronchi, these large bronchi and bronchioles that are cut end-on. And they look very large towards the outer periphery. This is bronchiectasis. Okay? So this patient actually has Cartaginous syndrome. And this is one of those rare syndromes I don't want to talk about for long. But it's sinus invertus, and you get abnormal frontal sinuses and primary ciliary dyskinesia. So the cilia in the lungs don't work, and they don't clear the mucus, and they end up getting bronchiectasis. Um, this patient was really funny, because if you look at, back through her notes, she had some uh, right iliac fossa pain, and she presented to the surgeon, local surgeons in the hospital, and it kept them confused for days, because it was actually sigmoid diverticulitis, but because she's got sinus invertus. All the organs are back to front, including the heart, so she's got dextrocardia. So that, that's quite funny. 